four, six. I'm the Nito Tiemtek, Tanis Peranto, Nitsi Gasan. Oh. Hello, like everyone, and welcome to Sacred Spaces, honoring yeah. our elders and our stories of living culture. Today, our yeah. guest is Irma Laguer and Yvonne Dennis. I'm going to hand it over now to Irma and Yvonne, and we're going to get started listening to the stories that they have. Oh, great. So, my story is that I came here from the island of Puerto Rico as a little girl in 1958. I think this is a picture. You can see my mother with eight children. She had 10. And um, Yvonne wrote a story about this and she was reading it to me the other day. When I, we got here, um, it was very strange because I've never been in a city. I was raised, I was, I'm a mountain girl. I'm like what they call a hibara, one of the hibaros. And I lived out there and it was, uh, it was a peaceful, quiet existence. My grandmother was what we call the uh, comadrona. She was the uh, healer. She was the medicine woman. She's the one that was there for all the babies that were coming into the world. And, and our little pueblito, right, of Mocha. So my mother told me the stories that when it was time for her to give birth to me, by then she already had five children and she, mind you she was in her early 20s by then so and she's working the fields so when she was getting that uh so when it was time for her to give birth she came into um we had like a, a almost it almost looked like a bohio if you know bohios from the island they're like little shack type you know dwellings and my mother came in she squatted, I came out, and then she went to work in the fields. That's, that's how it was. And my grandmother took the baby, cleaned me up, blah, blah, put me down, and, and that was it. And everybody went on to do their business. That's how it was then. And the quick little story is, we lived a very indigenous type life there. We, ate what we planted, we ate the food, we, we, there was, uh, with me, it was, I was the sixth child, and my father, a, a, just an aside, my father was 38 years older than my mother, so he was there when my mother was born, and that's when they, and it was a arranged marriage between my, my mother and my father and uh, the community felt that he would be the perfect match for my mother because he was a um he was a, a sort of like numbers runner type guy and the guy who who go fishing and bring it back to the community to give it out to everybody he was uh, a wheeler and dealer and he was eligible and my grandmother said he's perfect and then he also had um he also had cattle and he had horses. So he was able to give that to my grandmother and my grandmother said, okay, then you can have, you know, my, my daughter. And he married her when she was 12. So mind you, that would be, uh, you know, that's illegal now. So at 12 years old, uh, he married my mother. My mother didn't have children until she was maybe in her late teens. But uh, that was our life and our existence in up in the mountains and up in, you know, the woods and living in a little house. And it was an easy way of life. And then one day we got, my mother received some money from my father's father who left some money to her. And so she took the money and she said, you know, let me go to the mainland because my brothers are there already. So she had to make a decision whether to go to Canada or go to New York. And she always loved Canada. So she thought it had, but then she had her brothers in New York. 
So at the last minute, she decided, okay, we'll buy a plane ticket and we'll take all those eight children with us on the plane to New York. And so we made the headlines. Immigrants coming to New York. Mind you, we weren't immigrants. But that was what the headlines read in the New York Post at the time. Eight children, my mother, my father. So we landed in El Barrio, Spanish Harlem. And it was very strange because even though we spoke Spanish and my father had his dialects, he knew Mesteca and he knew and he spoke Nahuatl because he was Aztec. He, um, it was all strange to me because I've never been, I was never been, I've never been to a big city. And I was a little girl, it was all very confusing. So I grew up in the city, but I grew up pretty much very traditional. We stayed within the family confines. We never left our block. My brothers would take care of us. It was, um, it, we were really well guarded and well taken care of by the uncles and the brothers. The story that I want to say is when I was in, I think I was eighth, eighth grade or ninth grade, and I was heading towards my, uh, my school, and I had to take the train. When I took the train, there was this man at the corner, this dark-skinned, tall man, and every time I would pass by, he would say to me, I'm going to get you. One of these days, I'm going to get you. And I paid it no mind, and I just kept scurrying, you know, and going to the train and going and going home, going to school. And every day this would happen. So one day, I was with my mother looking out the window in her, the fire escape, and we're just looking at people down, and I see the man at the corner, and I tell my mother, hey, Mom, that's the man that... See that black skinned man over there? He's the one that's always telling me he's going to get me. And my mother said, what? And I said, uh, uh, I got a little nervous. I said, that man. She says, what man? And I said, that, that man at the corner. He goes, oh, really? So she said, well, stay right here. So she leaves. And then she comes back with this man that I, I don't really know him. Tall, tall guy. And he comes in and he tells me, um, who, who, show me who that is. And I said, uh, is that man over there? He says, okay. All right. So then he leaves and then my mother leaves too. And she goes to this basement. We had, um, call it what you will, a council of elders or people who took care of us. And it was in this basement where the uncles were. And she went down there and she told them everything that was happening and how she needed her help because she needed to deal with this particular person who she was afraid that was going to steal me. So the next morning, I get a knock on the door right before I go to school and he, the two tall men tell me, we're going to take walk with you. And I said, okay. So I walked down the street going to to back to the same direction I always go on Lexington Avenue, going to the train. And then they said, we're gonna go across the street and we're gonna watch to see what happens. I said, okay. And I kept walking and lo and behold, the man came back again. And he says, I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna grab you, I'm gonna take you. You know, and he kept saying those things. And I'm like this little, you know, indigenous girl just walking down my big long pigtails, just going, you know, not bothering. I said, keep going. So then they walked across the street because they heard it. So they walked across the street and they told me, keep going. So they went and I, the last I saw was they were talking to him. The next day I was going to school and he wasn't there. So I go to my mom and I said, mom, the guy's not there. She says, don't worry about it. And I never saw that man again, ever. The uncles uh, took care of it. The community took care of it. But it was very difficult living in, in Spanish Harlem because we were very different. I was still this 
hillbilly type girl, he but off, you know, from the mountains. I didn't know the city life. I didn't understand anything that they were. I ate traditionally. I ate all the types of fruits and vegetables that are grown in the woods, you know, the nightshade, like um, they're really Taino names, like Yvonne would know the yuca, yautia, yame, all these things are like, these are all the traditional names in Taino for these uh, vegetables, and they're nightshade vegetables. And we would eat them with codfish and stuff. And, and uh, my mother would make uh, something that was close to fry bread, because I, I would remember always coming home before going up to the fifth floor flat that we had, and I would always smell the fried food that my mother would make. They're called... Um, I don't like sort of like empanada types, but they were fried and then she would put some powdered sugar on it. It was very similar, like fry bread. Very, very similar. If not, it might have been the same thing because we all have pretty much the same type of foods. And I always look forward to that. But growing up, my father always told me, see, my father spoke many different dialects. He spoke, um, he spoke the Mesteca dialect. And he also spoke the um, uh, Nahuatl, but he never taught me. And the reason why he never taught me the language, he said it was because of my mother. He said that my mother wanted us to become Americanized. He didn't want uh, us to have any problems. So he was not going to teach it. But I used to, I remember used to always see him in his room uh, meditating and chanting. And I always wanted to learn the language, but he kept telling me, no, I can't teach it to you because your mother won't allow me to. And I just, I'm not going to, to do this. So, but, but he did tell me growing up, he always says, don't forget, no matter what anybody tells you, you come from a great nation. You come, you are Azteca. Never forget that you are Azteca, no matter what anybody tells you, even though you don't know the language, you don't know the language, but you are Azteca. Always remember that. And your name is not Laguerre. The Laguerre name came from the man who enslaved my father and my grandfather during the French-Mexican War. Um, and your name was La Confu. That's your real name. La Kung Fu and your people are in Mexico. You won't find them because they live way out over the mountains, you know, and they're basket weavers. And sometimes they, you know, they come into the city and trade and stuff, but he always made sure that he told us that and we listened closely. But um, I tried to find my family once, trying to find people from, that were going back and forth to Mexico, but a lot of the people that I knew that were um, from Mexico, they would tell me that the La Confu people were in the northern part of the mountains of Mexico, and these people do not come into the city. So there's just no way that you would be able, if you went to Mexico, you would not be able to go into that area because there's a lot of uh, um, like gorillas, you know, um, people who will hurt you. So uh, if you don't know them, so it's best not to go there. And if you do go there, go with a guide. So I never did that. But that was one of the stories that um, I remember growing up and knowing how, how careful my family took care of us um, in during those uh, years. That was one story. Yvonne, you remember something else? Well, why don't you tell I us? I can't hear you. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? I think you're muted. No, I don't okay. think so. I can hear you. Let me see if I can turn up my speaker. Irma, can you, can you hear you me? Mute yourself? Irma, can you hear me? Can't hear you. You can't Janice? hear anyone? Oh, so it must just be Irma's. Yeah, because I can hear everybody. I can't even hear Tannis. Oh, okay. I think <laughs> maybe I'll just type in the chat for her. We're having a glitch. Let's see if her speakers are turned up. the chat. <laughs> Can you look in the chat? 
<laughs> Irma, look in your chat. <laughs> Yeah, right now. Can you hear me? Uh huh. Okay. Yvonne, I was asking you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Yay. Well, I was, um, if you want, I can read the story, but then I was also thinking you should tell them the story about how your mother made you get married and then how she ended the marriage. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So, because we came from a very uh, close-knit family and community, the way that uh, we were taught, if you meet someone and you start a relationship with someone, that's the someone that you're going to be with forever. So my first boyfriend ever was the guy that I married. And I was 17 years old. And my mother said, uh, you have to marry him. You've been with him. People are going to talk. The community is going to talk. It's best for you to marry him. So I said, okay. So my mother addressed me. I didn't pick anything. She did everything for me. She picked the dress. She picked the shoes. She picked the place. She, uh, she invited the people. She took care of everything. I just had to show up to the ceremony which is what I did. I showed up to the ceremony. I got married. We were there for about a year. We were together for a year. During that time, I was going to college, actually, because I had entered um, a college at seven, 16. I was in college. I was at the Manhattan School of Music. I had graduated very early because my grades were high. So I was at Manhattan School of Music and I was very much involved with the woman's movement at that time. And my husband at the time thought that, that they were giving me too many ideas to be for me to be independent. And, and he didn't want me to be that because he wanted to be in charge of my life. And I wasn't going to have that. So one day I was coming home and he came behind me and I, he got into the apartment and he said to me, <laughs> and he said to me, he said, I am, uh, you're seeing someone, I don't trust you. Uh, I, I, I know something's going on. And I said, nothing's going on. And then his mother came and she says, I put a detective on you and I'm following you. Make sure that you're the wife you're supposed to be. And I went, oh my God. So I went and I, mind you, my family didn't know. I've only been, I was only, I had only moved there maybe for a few months living in this new place on Grand Street. When all that happened, I went, I called my mother on the phone. So at that time they had the phone with the long cord, right? So um, I'm, I'm calling my mother, I say, mom, I don't know what's going on, but they're accusing me of all these things. I don't know what to do. Um, you need to help me. So my mother said, um, okay, just be, be um, what's going on right now? And I said, I don't know. And then all of a sudden I looked up and I see his mother coming towards me with some scissors. And I said, mom, um, she has some scissors. She cuts the phone right when I say she has scissors. She cut the phone line. So, mind you, my mother's in the other end. So she thinks the worst. Mind you, my mother doesn't know where I live. My mother told my brother, get in the car. We're going to go and find Irma. And my brother said, but mom, we, I don't know where, I don't know where she lives. And my mother said, just listen to me. I will tell you where to turn. I will tell you how to get there. So they get in the car. They get on the FDR. They get in. My mother says, okay, you turn right here. Mind you, my mother doesn't read. She doesn't read uh, or write because she was taken out of, you know, when she was very early, early on to take care of the kids and work the land and all that stuff. So she has this feeling. She goes, okay, you make a right right here. So my brother's okay, because he's, he's blindly driving. So he makes a turn and what she says, make a turn. And he said, okay, we're gonna park right here. We're gonna stand right here. Give me a moment. And all of a sudden I'm coming down the stairs. And my mother said, um, there she is. And my brother is 
perplexed to, to this day. He doesn't know how my mother found me. You know, it was like, you know, my mother was very spiritual. So she followed, um, she followed her spirit to find me. So we get there and my mother said, let's go upstairs. So we go upstairs and my mother's so prepared. So we get there and his mother, my husband's mother is yelling at me. He's upset and stomping and carrying on. So my mother goes and she, she takes this, uh, all these incense that she had and she had this tobacco. So she starts smoking and blowing tobacco and going, nothing's gonna happen to her. Nothing's gonna happen to her. And you stay away from my daughter. And she stomped me, she's doing a stump dance on, 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 in the apartment. And I'm there going, holy shit. What, you know, um, you know I, was, I was in my mother's attic and she's smoking and she's blowing tobacco and she's throwing some type of incense and stuff and she's stomping, you know, and she's doing all this stuff to stop her from whatever she was doing. Cause she kept saying, oh, I'm gonna do something to her. I'm gonna get a serpent and I'm gonna have it wrapped around her and she's gonna die tonight. She's gonna, and my mother said, nothing's gonna happen to you. And you know that I walked out of that marriage that day and I never went back. I left everything behind, everything that I, I had in that marriage. And I went back to my mom's house and that was one of the stories. And that's when I found out that my mother kept, uh, a very traditional altar. It was like her, because when we were in the island, the missionaries were there, the Catholic missionaries, and they were trying to convert everyone. And my mother never converted, but she wanted us to just do whatever the Catholics were doing. So she made us go to church. She never once went to church, ever. But she made us go, right? But she always had her altar of tobacco and water and sage and plants and everything was always there. And she was always using it. And she was always um, with the shell. She had something similar to the shell and she would put it and burn it and with tobacco and light the, and clean out the whole house. She would do that often. And I grew up with all that, but I didn't really understand it until much, much later much much later i understood it remember yvonne that was those were fun times her so, mother was a trip <laughs> she was a trip i loved her read the story that you wrote there's some people um there's some people commenting on facebook as you as you had told this story um some people are saying you uh, someone named sunny sage said you got me crying <laughs> he says bravo mom they're cheering you. Wolf Heart mm -hmm. Sanchez, sounds like the Buffalo's dance. Your mother was powerful and she was not playing, dear elder. <laughs> yes. Well, it says, I feel this. Someone was wondering where the mountains were. I, they might have missed the beginning. It's Moca, Moca. We were from a very small pueblito called Moca. And it's up, up, up in, in the mountain, up on, up on the mountain, away, a little bit more away from the water. You know, and then we moved to Aguadilla, which is closer to, to the water. Yeah, fa Facebook land out there. If you have any questions, just type them into the comments and I can read them as we go. Yvonne, did you have a story that you were going to read? Before this I is uh, the first chapter. It, I told you I'm doing a series on different people. And this is at Irma's first chapter. Um, then it's A Gift to America, Irma Laguerre, actress, singer, activist, storyteller, educator. Irma Laguerre is an internationally known singer, actress, and storyteller. She is also an educator, activist, and director of the Children's Cultural Center of Native America in New York City, which teaches the truth about Native Americans to children and their teachers. From the, remind you, this is a children's story, okay? From the life of Broadway to Native American festivals across the country to a theater in Paris, Irma shares her art with the world. But Irma was not always a star of a TV series or the lead in a musical production. And so her journey began. Chapter one, get off, Petey. Jimmy, get out. Tony, leave me alone. Mom! Irma's mother rushed into the living room, her wooden spoon poised for battle. I told you kids to let Irma practice. 
stop touching the piano and bothering your sister. Either go play on the roof or in front of the building. I've had it with you guys. And put Petey back into his cage. Now, he swung the big, big wooden spoon and the little boys and rooster went scattering in the direction their mother pointed. Lo siento, mi amor. Pay them no mind. Irma's mother brushed Petey's feathers off the piano and returned to the kitchen. Right, Irma thought. Pay them no mind. Easy for you to say as they're afraid of you. She kept her thoughts to herself and went back to the piano. The high, that highly varnished upright piano was the focus of the living room. Framed photographs of Irma and her nine brothers and sisters decorated the flat top of the instrument, providing a constant audience for her as she bent over the keys, forcing out scales and a tooth. All sounded foreign to her family. The word foreign made Irma mad, and she wished she hadn't thought of it. She studied the framed newspaper article on the wall over the family pictures. Emigrants arrive in America, the headlines announced, and underneath the bold letters was a grainy photograph of her, her parents, and siblings deplaning at Kennedy Airport after an anxiety-ridden trip from her country to Puerto Rico. But emigrants, police. Stupid people didn't even know that Puerto Rico was part of America, a colony as a matter of fact. So how could we be immigrants? Foreigners? And especially since my father was an indigenous Mexica from Mexico who emigrated to Puerto Rico and then back to the mainland. Texas was once part of Mexico, as quiet as it's kept. Weird, Irma thought. They didn't even teach the truth in any of the classes she'd taken in all the years she'd been in school. Now here they were, 12 years after that newspaper article had been written, far from the rural area of her childhood. All her family members, along with their pet rooster Petey, were squashed into the three-bedroom <laughs> apartment in Spanish Harlem. The mambos and salsas floated in through the open windows. Not too much Hebrew music of her mountain home, but she had gotten used to the New Yorican music and liked it but not when she was trying to master the European classics. Irma Ixalaguer, or far-seeing woman, her Indian name, had just turned 16 and was soon to graduate from high school, an all-girls public school in downtown Manhattan. High school had been hard and not because of the work. Actually, she had soared through her classes and was graduating two years earlier than most students. No, hard, because her older brother, Eduardo, often just showed up at the school to check on her. <laughs> she always had to behave. No hanging outside the building and smoking cigarettes or pot with the older girls, with the other girls. No flirting with the boys in Union Square Park. None of that. Eddie's university was close to her school, and he had the responsibility of watching over his younger siblings. He took it so seriously that she felt like one of those mummies from ancient Egypt, bound, gagged, and embalmed. And it had gotten worse when Irma's music teacher had declared her a mega talent and predicted she would have a career on the opera stage. Opera? Please. She was more interested in American bandstand and partying with the other kids. At least that's what she told herself and her disapproving friends. But then no one had to ever remind her to practice the piano or go to her music lessons or vocalize all those funny, strange sounds. Nope, she did it and was happy doing it. Still, her family reminded her all the time of the teacher's prediction that she would be a star someday. She had no time to socialize and never really felt like a teenager, or at least she felt very different from her teenage classmates. And their brothers never met them after school, protective and stern and lecturing. Gee, embarrassing. This made her really feel like a foreigner. Irma's teacher had pushed her to audition for Yale Music School. The audition was next week right here in Manhattan. The thought of going to college in Connecticut really frightened her as she'd never been away from her family. She wasn't even used to sleeping alone. She had shared a bed with her sisters until two of them got married. Now she had a bed to herself, but still shared the room with her youngest sister. Irma was an excellent speller, but the word Connecticut had been a challenge to spell until she picked it apart and made two words, connect and cut. At least she could spell it properly, although she'd never been there. Back to vocalizing. The louder the street music and the traffic, the louder she sang. 
Her elderly and hard of hearing father watched television in her parents' room. She sang louder than the TV, which was turned up at least 10 decibels above the <laughs> Her mother did piecework in the little room off the kitchen. The sewing machine clanked and whirred so loudly that the walls shook. Adama's song vibrated to the same rhythm of the machine and overpowered it. Adama's extraordinary and beautiful mezzo-soprano voice gusted to the tenements across the avenue and probably resounded from the Harlem River to the Hudson River, drowning out dog talk, ice cream truck melodies, church bells, glaring cabs, playground clamor, bus belches, and the panic screams of ambulances and police vehicles. And Irma's parents, brothers, and sisters worked, studied, played games, watched television, and talked on the phone as if it were perfectly quiet in the house. And each one at different times paused, listened to her incredible octave range, and imagined her to be the headline of a new newspaper paper article framed and hung over the piano. Adama, star of the Metropolitan Opera. Okay. That's chapter one. That's good, Yvonne. Wado. Wado, wado. So that's a um, couple of things, just growing up in an area that was, uh, should have been very familiar to me, but in a way it really wasn't. So I kind of grew up in, in Spanish Harlem with people calling me Red. Hey, Red. Every time walking down the street, hey, Red. And then it was between Red and Indian. Hey, Indian. You know, Red. And it was constant. After a while, me telling people to stop doing that, it just, I just took it in stride, you know. And my family, I, I had six brothers and they were always very protective. So um, everybody knew that. And after a while, when that man had disappeared, it, it made my family, my family became a powerful family in the neighborhood. They became a family not to mess with, not to fool around with. But then that meant that I could have no boyfriends because everybody was afraid of my brothers. You see, so they had a nickname for my family and somebody one day we woke up and in graffiti, they have wrote in the, the Popeye family lives here. Don't mess with them. So every time one of us would call, they would say, oh, there's Popeye because my brothers were very big and strong guys and they didn't let anybody mess with any of us. So, and I, as a little girl, even though I remember always playing uh, and the mountains and playing with the dirt and digging out the snakes from the ground when it rained and it was a lot of fun. I couldn't do that in Manhattan. I wasn't even allowed to play in the streets. My mother wouldn't allow that. She said it was, you can't do that because these boys are strangers and they're going to look at you and you, you, we can't do that. And my uncles would come by and check on us all the time. It was, it was ridiculous. It was like, yeah, I, I couldn't move around that way. So I think that one of the reasons why I just went along to get married at 17 was because it was a way to just get away from all that, just start a new life. Little did I know that my one year in that marriage was going to be hell, pretty much. It was the worst experience of my life, you know, with, with him and his mother and, and the way that they behaved towards me. And I'm glad in a way that my mother came in, came in and ended it and ended that marriage for, for me. I mean, I, one year, that's all it lasted, one year. But I, I learned a lot from it. I learned a lot not to get married again, that's for sure. And, um, and, uh, my, and, my, and my four sisters, they were very strong women too. None of them, I was actually one of the youngest ones and I was the first one to get married of my family. Because I think when I did tell my mother that I liked that boy, and my mother just said, okay, that's it. And none of the other sisters or brothers were pretty much interested in, in anyone. So it was just, it was just me. So it was, it was quite an experience. It's almost, it almost repeated itself when I moved to this block that I live now on 107th. 
And this is going back before, I think before I had Taina, Yvonne, before I had Taina, where there was this Italian man down the street and every time I would walk by, he would say, hi, chief. Mr. Jimmy, you know. Yes, he would say, hey, chief. And I said, would you please stop saying that to me? And he says, hey, there's another chief up the block. That, that was Yvonne. And I said, another chief of the block, okay. And then I met Yvonne, and then we found out that we were, you know, she's just across the street from me. So then I got more involved in more of the activities that Yvonne was involved in, which made it really interesting. I got deeper in, into the Native community that I wasn't as deep in before. Actually, you know, but, what, what happened is um, before that, the community house called me. I used to work for the Native American Education Program, and they called me frantically one day. They were trying to get everybody to go to this audition for the Mazzola Corn Oil Girl because they were just sure they were going to give it to someone from the dominant culture. And I said, well, you know, I don't act anymore. That had been my major, but I changed it and doing social work. And I said, I, I, no, just go. We just want to say, you know, if we send 50 people and they don't choose one, they're not going to, it, it won't be an excuse. It'll just be racism. And I said, all right. So I go to the audition and I remember they had me holding up, I guess was the corn. Mm -hmm. And I, all I could think of was that old Jerry Lewis movie where he's eating corn like it's a uh, type, you know, a like that, like a typewriter, and then when he'd get to one end, it would ding. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I didn't get the part, which I didn't expect to. But then um, Mr. Gimino, the Italian man who called us both chiefs, at least he didn't call us both princesses, um, he said, oh, yeah, that, that girl I've been telling you about, she's the Mazzola corn oil girl. And I went, oh. I'm on this block, are you sure? And I had seen her around, we waved at each other, but we never really spoke. And it was Irma, and we literally can see, we are right across the street, and we can see each other's uh, apartments, our windows face each. I'm on the fifth floor, she's on the sixth floor, we can see each other, see what we're cooking for dinner. <laughs> And what, what year was this? I, is this something I could Google and maybe find? Uh, it was, what what year were was you that? Did I have Taina yet? Uh, Taina wasn't no, born yet. No, she wasn't no, this born was yet. Way before, this was way before Taina. That was before 1992. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, Jaman was a little guy then. Jaman was maybe four, three or four. And he's okay. 38 now. So it was a long time ago. In the eighties, um, yeah, it was in the eighties, okay. and I'll the, see if I can dig it up. <laughs> the first Mazzola or um, my cousin. Let's see if I have a picture. I I'm up here in Ithaca without all my pictures and stuff, so I was looking through what I had. But um, one of my cousins, it was so funny. We were at the McBurney Y. This was when the Mazzola corn oil commercial first came out. And I, I had just moved to the city from New Jersey. Oh, where's that picture of Sam? Anyway, so he had done me a favor and I was very happy. And we'd gone to the McBurney powwow and I don't even remember what the favor was, but I said to him, I'll do, I'll, uh, I'll do, do anything for you, anything you want. He says, I want to meet her because the first Mazzola corn oil girl was in the bar in, in the, I can't remember the name of the bar, across the street. And this is my cousin, Sam. I don't know if you can see him and his regalia. Well, anyway, and so I went right over to her and I said, hi, I'm so-and-so and so. My cousin wants to meet you and he's really a good looking man. She goes, oh, sure. So I took Sam over, and I and I know lot, many of you know him. He has a gift of gab. He was over there, going a hum and a hum and a hum. <laughs> he couldn't speak. So then I got to introduce him to the second Mazzola corn oil girl. And then you told me, "Do not date him. Do not date my cousin." 
No. Don't let him sweep you off your feet. Do not date him. Because that's how I lose my friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember. God. And yeah, so, and Yvonne, tell me the story about you and the Adirondacks and you, you the, the Appalachian. The Appalachian. The Appalachian. Tell us that stories. Um, well, most of you know the diaspora of Cherokee people. So we have relatives in, you know, Oklahoma, North Carolina. But my particular great grandfather was um, a wrangler, and he used to be all up and down the Appalachians finding wild horses. Um, that's what they say. More likely, probably borrowed them because he didn't think white people should be having so much. But anyway, he and then he would train them and sell them. And um, the Lenape people gave the Cherokee people refuge from starting in 1780 something. I should have looked this up. I'm not good with dates. But anyway, so some of my family had already come up you know, cause I, I don't want to go into history, but you know what happened with the Cherokees. It, it, it wasn't just the Trail of Tears. It started be the removal act started before that. And even, you know, Cherokee people were very prosperous farmers and um, their farms were taken anyway. So the Lenape people whom we consider our grandfathers gave us refuge. And so some of my family had come up. And then, you know, when the Lenape were preyed upon, and us too, a lot of Cherokee went uh, north and into uh, Pennsylvania and settled near Keating Mountain. And so the community where I was born, and when I lived with my uh, native grandparents, was a farming community. And the people, the only thing I could say, they were isolationists. So everything was a secret. They, like Irma's family, had the reputation of kicking people's butts when they bothered them. In fact, when my son, um, when my son was around 10, we went back to, because I'd gotten out of touch with a lot of my family. My, you know, I'm in touch with, I have uh, hundreds of cousins, but I'm in touch with, say that story but anyway so um when i was asking for my family the guy in this little motel out there in the woods said oh you mean those indians <laughs> the way he said it my son was like pulling on me to leave he got really scared so um but anyway they they even have their own cemetery um and we're Great at doing lots of things. We're smart people, great at doing lots of things. And everything was a secret. Ceremony was a secret. We're going to do this. It's the exact opposite of what we tell our children now. No secrets. Secrets hurt, but we had to. That's why it was shocking for me to come to the New York City area and see so many non-native people at ceremony and at powwows and things because um, here they are celebrating our culture where I grew up. It was, you know, you had to, it was best to keep it secret. My grandfather was very proud that he was not a Christian, very, very proud. And I have some Bible thumpers in my family and they said when he died some of them said oh we saved him we saved him um that's probably why he lived so long because he didn't want to be saved I don't know but <laughs> anyway um it was interesting but I was my sister and I had a very difficult upbringing my mother is first generation Syrian. And Syrians like Cherokee people and other native people have a very strong family tradition. Like you, you can't do anything without your family. If you have a savings account and someone in your family could be a fifth cousin needs something, you just 
give them the money. So, but it's okay because it comes back to you. So my great grandfather, my uh, on my um, father's side, and my grandfather on my Syrian side <coughs> were both people who left family, who struck out into the world and tried to be independent. Um, and I was like that. I couldn't wait to get away. My parents, the only thing they agreed on was how much they hated each other. Um, and my father also did everything to get away from family. So my parents, my mother was not a typical Arab girl. She wanted to be a dancer and one of her aunts secretly paid for dancing lessons for her. And my mother was taken out of school to work in a factory when she was 13 and she kept running away from home. Um, she wanted to dance and lied about her age and she joined the USO uh, dancing troupe entertainment when she was 16. And that's where she met my father. And they got married three days later and had me and, um, and then had my sister. But my mother knew this wasn't the marriage for her because the first time she, she was a city girl. She grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> but the first time she went to meet my father's family, it was bear hunting time. And the women kept camp while the men go out and hunt bear. And my mother, I don't even know if she'd ever been in the woods before, but she was miserable and she said she was delirious. Um, she'd never been so cold in, in her life and hungry because she didn't like the food. But anyway, she said, I knew I wasn't gonna stay married to that bastard, <laughs> but she liked his family. And then when he went into the service, she left, well, I was quite ill, I had polio, but she left me with my grandparents, my native grandparents, and then got together with my father again long enough to have my sister, and so we both were left there. We were very happy living with my native grandparents. And then um, when my, um, my, my grandmother uh, died and my father came He'd gotten out of the service and remarried and settled in California. He took my sister and me. And so the FBI was involved. It was a big mess. And my mother, I don't know if she really wanted us, bless her heart, but she didn't want him to have us. So while they duped it out in court, my sister and I were in an orphanage and separated because we were a year apart. And so she was in the four-year-old room, I was in the five-year-old room, and I remember like staying up every night, and there was a glass partition separating us with our noses pressed against the wall, um, against the glass, looking at each other and crying. But there were other Native kids there, um, but I, I don't remember much about it. Um, but I just know it was not the place I wanted to be. So my mother had remarried, and so she got custody of us. And then she was afraid to let us go to our native family because she thought we'd get kidnapped again. Um, so we were older when we were able to go back and it was defiance on our part. <coughs> Excuse me, but she lived away from her family too. So every chance I got, I, because I always um, liked old people better than people my age, which is good because now I can like myself because I'm an official old person. But we, you know, every chance I got, I spent with the elders on both sides of my family. And I was able to learn a lot of things that the other grandchildren didn't learn just because I was more interested. But just growing up, you know, we never felt like we belonged any place. In the little town where I lived uh, with my mother, there were, she was the only Arab person and we were two of five Indian kids. And um, 
so kids used to say things to us like your mother you live in a teepee and your mother cooks dinner over camel dung you know everything and and um but they didn't say it too long because my sister used to beat them up i never had i'm the oldest but i never had to fight she would, oh, she did all the fighting and of course my mother would come out with a broom and club everybody they were they were very afraid of my family in that little town afraid of my mother and um she said they it, i remember her saying um after 9 11 she says i um they don't know what a terrorist is i'm the terrorist <laughs> and, yeah which was a bad joke but you know we under we understood but anyway um i went to school in ohio as far away from I was a theater major, so I wanted to go to a small school. So I found this school. They had an excellent theater department, and off I went. Um, but that wasn't the job. That wasn't the major for me. I didn't like the competitive nature of it all. But um, I was just happy to be away from home. My mother and stepfather did not get along. I didn't get along with anybody. Um, and then I moved from there to New Jersey and where I reconnected with cousins that I hadn't seen since I was a child living with my grandparents and still very close to them. And um, I know that people say New York City is a wicked place, but I never found it to be so. I mean, my best friend lives across the street. Um, anyway, I eventually became the director of the New Jersey American Indian Center, and then I left to, I, I married a New Yorker who had to live in New York, and so I ended up in New York City. But I really have been so blessed by knowing people. Like when I first came to this part of the world, I never even heard of half the tribes of people who live here, like Shinnecock, Matinecock, um, you know, I was like so, um, I, I, I was like joyful to know all these people existed. Um, and I every day was able to learn something new. Uh, and it, it was just, it was great. And, and to connect with Cherokee people from all over, that was that was such a gift too. And I, I never cursed or anything until I met New York City Indian women. They had a lesson, some of them had a lesson for me in how to curse because they used to, because I speak kind of slowly. And I guess I used to say things like, mother fucker. <laughs> Can't say that on live, right? <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> Tell me how to say a property bag from the gut. This is how you curse. Um, so I think some of you know people in my family. I don't know, but I want to show you this picture. I feel like I jumped all over. Oh, when I moved to New York City, um, I first worked for this national nonprofit corporation that um, a Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin started, and they brought um, uh, people on to make it. They were, were trying to reach out to the Native community. So they hired Joe Cabancy in Syracuse, which is an hour from here, and Jimmy, Nadima Agard's brother, and me. Those two worked in local offices and I worked in the national office. And it was great because, you know, I traveled all, all over and although I did get kind of sick of it, but I did get to visit many communities, many native communities to represent the, the organization. And one time we were going to, the three of us were going to the uh, National Urban Indian Council's conference, which, which was in Albuquerque. So um, my, my boss, who was the director of the agency, called me in and he says, um, well, I think it's a good idea that you go. It was a three-day conference, he says, but 
I know you're not going to like this, but it would be more economically, it would be economically better for us if the three of you stayed for a whole week rather than just three days. I said, oh, yes, that's a big sacrifice. But, um, you know, it was fun. And the first three years I lived in New York, I didn't really live in New York because I was gone all the time, all over the country. We had a uh, hundred offices and I was in charge of field training and also outreach to native communities. So I never felt like I lived there. And when, after my son was born and I did live there, I think it was the first time I ever had a panic attack because I just felt so claustrophobic being in, in the city and I mean, when I first moved to the city, I got them, before I moved in, I, I did this campaign to get trees planted on our block. And the day I moved in, they were planting trees. Um, so it was just like a real, because I'd lived in cities before, but never such a big city and never one, you know, I mean, I lived in cities where the graveyard was across the street with lots of trees or you know it was a whole it was really different for me but then um i got used to it i was volunteering for the native american education program which was two blocks away from my house and they offered me a job so it was to go back to my job my job where i was on maternity leave a well a really good paying job and um be traveling all the time around three weeks out of the month with my baby at home, you know, and or take a $20,000 pay cut and work in the neighborhood. So I chose to work in the neighborhood because I really wanted to be a mom. And we somehow, you know, made it work. I feel very blessed. Um, but then I got very, very ill. And that illness was a gift because I began my second career, which was writing. So I went from social work and education to writing. And then Irma and I, Irma's a, uh, both of us artists in different ways. When I was too sick to work nine to five, we wrote this grant for a preventative mental health, um, a holistic preventative mental health program based on indigenous values and it got funded. So we split the job, we split the director's job so mm -hmm. that we could be at home with, I could be at home with my sickness and she could be at home with her daughter. I mean, we still had to go out to work, but you know, so that's how Nietzsche came about. and. Um, Nietzsche and the Parents Committee of the Native American Education Program really organized it. And Nietzsche means our children in Lenape. So, and, you know, and now I live in two cities, Ithaca, which I love, and New York, which I love the people. I wish I could bring New Yorkers up here, but I love the Nietzsche was great because when we started to discuss it, it was actually Yvonne's son who came up with the, one of the names of the program, which was FAN, F-A-N, Family Awareness Network. We were stuck with what to call a family something, fan, and Jiman, her son, came up with that name, which was great. And then I had stopped working for a while in the business because my daughter was born with a metabolic condition that she needed a lot of attention. So then that's, we said, okay, let's continue. Yvonne actually, let's continue on with the Nietzsche and do this new program, this preventative mental health program. And that's when we started to work that program. We did, and we did break the, um, the uh, we were both directors, you know, we just worked together and we had some family coordinators and we were doing, we were bringing in, we had actually the same clientele that the American, the American in the community house had. We had the same people that were going to both places. So didn't at one time you tell the community house to join forces? We did, yeah. right? 
Well, that's, I come from a collaborative nature, not a competitive one, but uh, Reggie mm -hmm. and Tony would come and, and Reggie actually did a few. What we did, how we got clients to come is, um, our, we had the resolve to rebuild a strong indigenous community where people helped each other, provided respite for each other. And um, one of the women, one time, one of the moms said she was so glad to come to Nietzsche activities because it was the only time in her, it was the only time in her schedule where she could breathe the same air as other natives. But um, so the idea was to do something to make your life better, to change your habits. And so we had all kinds of um, training in holistic medicine and not just from here, because you know, native people have always been very pragmatic. Oh yeah, I like, you know, if you look in the burial sites, which I hope you don't do, but you see things from all over because people were real smart, were very pragmatic. And so here we live in, in a city that has Chinese herbal tradition, chiropractic, all these wonderful holistic modalities. So we didn't care what people chose as long as they are clients, as long as they chose something to make a better life. So we used to say we're going in, you know, we we felt like it was a supermarket of holistic modality. So someone would choose from the produce or maybe they were gonna be a vegetarian and someone else chose, um, oh, every year we used to bring in a medicine person from a different tradition mm -hmm. and do um, a retreat. And we worked on the um, historical grief and trauma, or as it's more affectionately called, post-colonial stress syndrome. And indeed, we saw people forming relationships. We got all the batterers out of the homes. Every mom on welfare now has a college degree. Um, all the kids who had been institutionalized were repatriated to their families. So we did a lot of really, really good work. Then our contract was turned over to the city, from the state to the city. We started having issues and it was always a big fight. And finally, they decided that they wanted us to just do things in a traditional way, which we were. But they wanted their traditions, which meant everybody be on drugs, um, only spend six months with the family. And I remember one family, it took six years for them to disclose to me that they had been, um, had experienced this particular type of childhood trauma. You can't do something in six months. And we also had to serve people in the neighborhood, which was not fair to them or to us. We were only set up to do, you know, indigenous, healing, if you will. But a lot of good things came from it. Um, we decided as a community to not apply for the funds because we did, we would have had to have a psychiatrist on staff and do all these things. Not that we don't believe in psychiatrists, but we believe that if you have an issue, let's look at what you're eating, what you're breathing how you're speaking to your children, how your husband's treating you. Let's look at those things first. And then if we resolve those issues and it hasn't gotten us any place, then um, maybe we'll look at psychiatric drugs. So they have a place, but we just felt that especially with our community, that it should not be first choice, um, you know, on the express train, it should be last choice. Um, so then we also we also try to get the Native Ed program back on. Oh yes, the Native American Continue. Education program back, which some of you young people, I don't think there are any people here with kids, but we had a terrible time. It was a big fight. This guy, remember Irma? He had a yes. hand on his gun to me. Um, one of the 
hoity-toities at the Board of Ed at a personal bodyguard. And when I went to speak to him, he actually put his gun, his hand on his gun and glared at me. And I said, oh, what are you going to do? Shoot me? Shoot me in the Tweed building. I, was, I remember that. That was at City Hall, wasn't that? No, it was at the Tweed building. It was the, right, at the Tweed building. City Hall. Yeah. You're gonna shoot us. Like, shoot me? You yeah. Know my mother is. Shut up, shoot you. Anyway, um, but these are some of the activities. This is my uncle teaching um, rattle making to some kids. Can you see this? Is grandfather building? Oh, okay. and this is uh, this is a photo from. Oh, uh, my naming ceremony. Yeah. Airman Tain is naming. Um, this is one from one of our retreats. That's I. Who's there? Um, that's Sherry. He's gone. Oh, that's Mestel. That's Jessica Mestel. Yeah, little little Jessica. Um, oh, this was from Native Vet. This was when. Let's see who else in here. <laughs> this there's Marty. The Mullins, the Mullins are there. Yeah, no, not in this picture. There's Stephanie, like Beth, Grandma Lee. her kids, me, my son, um, hugging Joni, Lorraine Canoe, one of Lorraine's kids, Jake Swam. Um, this was at um oh, what's his name? The John Lennon Strawberry Field. Plant, uh, planting trees. Um, this is, we always had good turnouts for our cooking classes. And we taught people how to make traditional healthy foods. Here's another, this was, this is another one of our, um, this is Mike Demon, who's Donica known as Donica. That Pauline? That's Pauline, Miss Aim herself. <laughs> He's, uh, he, he was leading one of our retreats. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? Oh, I just found this. This is, I gave Tina her first pair of cowboy boots. Oh. This is her opening up the pack. She still has those boots. <laughs> <laughs> and um, let's see. Oh, while you're looking, I'm just going to um, read some of these comments from Facebook. Okay. Uh, back when you were talking about growing up, Irma, um, Lois said, I'm honored to have heard the story she told. I can relate to how her mother wanted her to go to church and live a colonized way of life. I love her story so much. Um, Wobita Danka, big thank you. And Wolfheart <laughs> says, missing nature is something that resonates with me. It has a way of loving us beyond any human and teaching us beyond the greatest teachers. Your stories feel like home. He is a New Yorker missing New York. Um, Dee says, wow, McBurney powwow going back. <laughs> yeah, that's going back. And Wolfhart says, grandpa is awesome. Lois is wondering who these beautiful women are. They have such great stories. So I let her know to go read your bios in the <laughs> event page. And get our books. <laughs> and get the books. Get the books. That's, That's right. Listening to your story, Yvonne, you're funny. Fran says hello. Linda says, I remember those days when you were showing the old photos. And Dee misses Lorraine. Thanks for all the comments, everybody. And yeah, we are live streaming to Facebook's um, and there could be children watching on oh, okay. the Maybe let's not swear. <laughs> um, this, is, this is my clan mother. Oh, yeah. Who is that? Dr. Lee Piper. Who, who is that? Yvonne? Dr. Lee Piper. Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee. Lee Piper. She's my clan mother. She crossed over. Dr. Lee. Um, mm -hmm. This is. I just want to show you my, uh oh did I lose you? Yes, I did. Uh, yeah, Yvonne then. Linda says the bar was Blarney Stone. Pardon? Linda on Facebook, she said to tell you the bar was the Blarney Stone. Oh, the, how could I forget that? Blarney and McBurney. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is a picture of, I thought this was funny. This is my, Arab grandfather, who was very, um, 
who he he was in what's the civil defense thing or whatever they called it in World War II because his sons were both in the war. Um, this is oh, this is me when my hair was long, and these are some of my books. This is my last one. I'm actually working on the third book in this series by Visible Ink Press. And um, this, the book I'm working on now is Indigenous First. So if you know of any first, I'm more interested in the things that people don't know. Um, but this is the travel guide. Um, this is my, um, this is my sister. These are the Mistel kids. This is where? But no, that's Taina in there. Oh, that's Taina, right? And the Mistel kids are here. They're actually on the back. Ah, there they are. Was um, that the one that my brother and I were in? I think so. I'm trying to remember. Like, um, this is a a curriculum guidebook for fourth to eighth grade. Um, so where can people, can people find these books somewhere? Oh yeah, they're all available online. And they're on Amazon, books. right? This is um, my, the first book I did in the series I'm working on now. And some of you will find yourselves in here. Reggie is in, Reggie is in this book. This is my sister right here. Um, now that we're talking about and showing work, Irma, we want to hear all about your acting career too. Um, Yago Wahine just said it in the comments here. Um, my acting career? Yeah, your oh. performing career. Let us, let us know a little about that. How yeah, I, start, I started out actually very young. I started out performing, I think I must have been about nine years old that I, I worked with an international choir at nine years old and my, of course my mother traveled with me since I was a minor and we would go to the neighboring states like New Jersey, Connecticut. We did an occasional trip to Washington and um, I remember that everybody got paid and I always wondered Where's my money? How come nobody said? And little did I know later on that my mother was taking the money <laughs> and using it to, <laughs> yes, to pay for whatever. But that was okay. And um, so I started out, and one of the first plays that I ever did at 11 years old was Don Quixote. And um, I had a wonderful director who went on to build his own theater company, which was Spanish Repertoire Theater. I went, that's a, a quick story. I went on, I did um, a Lorca play um, and I did a, the, the uh, Fantastics, the musical, the Fantastics, where I did the role of Luisa. And now I, and that was for Repertoire uh, uh, Espanol, Spanish Repertoire Theater. So I remember the director called me five days before he had to go on an international tour to Central South America and the Caribbean. So he called me, he says, can you learn this in Spanish? And I went, oh my God. Oh, oh. and of course I said yes. And I had to brush up a lot of my, uh, my um, Castilian and a lot of the Spanish words that I didn't know. And he says, and don't worry. And I said, but how, what is the staging? What's the blocking? What do I do? And he said, don't worry, I'll teach you on the plane. I'll tell you what to do. In the meantime, it took me five days. But then, you know, when you're young, you, I, I was a fast learner. I learned, the, I learned two, three plays, like in a week. I, the music, the every, I just learned it. I don't know to this day if I could do that, but I know then I did it. And... Um, I think I must have been about 20 or 21 when I went on that tour. And that is an important tour for me because it taught me a lesson. First of all, I did learn it quickly. I went to Central and South America and I remember 
on the trip, the, the, on the plane, the director's telling me on this spot, you move over here. When you say this, you move over there. When he says that, move over there. So I didn't know. And I said, so when do we go on? He said, the first show is the next day. So as soon as I get there, I'm in the whole town. I'm saying, okay, all right. Um, and, this, and then he said, we'll put you all together and then we'll figure out the next day where everybody's going to be in what room because we're going to stay here for you know about a week. And I think I was uh, in Venezuela at the time. So I learned it and I'm on stage doing the fantastic, singing it in Spanish and I'm doing all what I'm supposed to do. And, and, and behind me, when there's a quiet moment, I turn over to the parents who play my parents and I say, am I in the right, move me, move me. I don't know where to go, move, you know, just push me, guide me to the spot because I was, you know, it was all new, but I did it I, and I came through. So the next day, the next day, when they were sorting out the, uh, the, the room, the hotel rooms, <clears throat> um, none of the women wanted to room with me because I was, not, I was what they call una india sucia, a dirty Indian. So nobody wanted to room with me. I was devastated. I have never experienced that type of racism direct in your face and i didn't know what to do i couldn't call my mother because you know I'm, I'm in a different country and it's going to cost me 150 dollars to make a phone call to the to this to the united states so i didn't know what to do and i i was i was frantic and i said well, what am i going to do and they said well you got to move room in with someone because that's the way the government is going to pay it so i went to all the other actresses and none of them wanted to room with me none of them one literally said it to my face. I'm not going to, I'm not rooming with you because I don't live with my door open. And I went, oh man. And I was crying. I was devastated. And I said, okay, so what do I do? So then the, the crew, a crew member, the wardrobe mistress came over. She was a South American woman. She came on, she says, room with me. And my other friend from the uh, from the crew, and I said, okay. So I spent that whole tour rooming with the crew, as opposed to the cast members. You know, so and I said, wow, this this it's there's real racism happening. So um, I did those plays, and then knowing that the director knew that I had learned everything so quickly. When I was in Caracas, Venezuela, in the Opera House, and I had just done Lorca, and I had done the Fantastics, and there was a lot of bravos and applause, and I was feeling great. And the next day, the reviews come out, and everybody comes over to me, oh my God, you got this phenomenal review, and the ambassador wants you to sing for him. The US, and I said, okay. So um, the director comes by, and it's, uh, the review was that I had a silver-plated tongue. Una plata, una garganta de plata, silver plated tongue. And I said, whoa, that's nice. And the director passed by me and he said, well, they didn't say it was gold. Oh. <gasps> yep. And I said, well, I guess he wanted me to learn the show. I bailed this, these people out and this is how they treated me. And they actually treated me like that through the whole tour. But I wanted to do the tour and then at one point, there was civil unrest because I was in Nicaragua doing the show and I had uh, CIA people block, you know, uh, guarding us at the door at the hotel because there was a lot of fighting and Sandinistas, you know, all that stuff. And um, I remember um, uh, hearing machine guns and firing and all that stuff. And I'm in the hotel room saying, uh, I don't know what to do. So that's when I call my mom. And I said, mom, and my mother said, what is that? And I said, those are cannons and those are fire. There's, there's a lot of militia out here. And she says, don't worry, you're going to be fine. Just do your job. You're going to be fine. I, I'm, I'm, you're, you're well protected. Don't worry. Just do your job do it, and you'll be home soon. You'll be home in about a month. Everything will be fine. So I took her, you know, her advice, which I always do. And she says, don't worry, bless you. The, the creator's watching you, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. So I had those problems in, um, I never worked with that company again, by the way. Good. At the end of the, uh, at the end of the, um, 
the production, I went to the director who came up to me. They said, oh, we want you to come in and do all the works for us. And I said, I will never, ever work for your organization again. You could pay me thousands of dollars. I will never work for you again. And they would say, but why, why? And I said, why? You would ask me why when you told me what you told me about the gold and when your, your, all your big stars here, all your diva stars that you have here, and they tell me they don't want to sleep uh, in the same room with me because I sleep like that I was a dirty Indian and that I sleep with my door open. No, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to be anywhere near you people. So I never work with them. To this day, I never work with them again. And let me tell you, they called me often to go back and do productions. And I said, never, ever. And people to this day still ask me, I don't know why you, you, you didn't go back and work with them. So I did do that. And then from there, I went on to, I, went, I was still going to school because I was during my break. So I finished my master's degree at, I went to Juilliard in Manhattan School of Music. So I finished my Manhattan School of Music, uh, got my master's there. I took a year into my doctoral of, of arts. And then um, I got a letter from Yale that I was accepted into Yale on a full scholarship to study with Phyllis Curtin, which I always wanted to work with and I always wanted to go to Yale. But then I, I was very immature and I was very young. I was still in my early 20s. And the dean of students at uh, Manhattan School of Music told me, don't take the Yale scholarship. Just, you know, it's time for you to go out and do your craft, go out. Now, if I had to do it over, I would go to Yale, you know, but because I was still young, I could have gone to Yale and gotten another master's, but that's another story. So I left the school and I started working. And then there came a time where they said, uh, there's auditions for the King and I. And I said, the King and I, were you a Brenner? And I said, oh, that sounds good. And I said, yeah, but I'm native. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they're going to take me because this is for Asians, you know? And I was very, I understood even then because I, I was a, you know, I was, had so much racism towards me. So I understood all that. And I said, I'm not going to take a, a, a job away from an Asian, you know? And uh, the office called me, the, the production company from the King and I, they kept calling me, come in, come in, it's going to be fine. And then I said, besides, a lot of my friends who were Asian were telling me, it doesn't matter. You're indigenous. It doesn't matter. You know, they're not going to find an actress that was born in Thailand. The role is for a Thai person. They're not going to find somebody from Thai. They'll probably find somebody from the Philippines, somebody from Hawaii, somebody from Japan, somebody from China, but somebody from Korea. But they're not going to find anybody. Just go and audition. So I went and audition, and I got the king and I, and I got the lead. I got Lady Chiang with Yul Brynner, and I did it. I did the role. Initially, I got the role of Top Tim. But then the girl who was playing Tupton decided she was going to stay on. And so they gave me the better role, which is, you know, the Lady Chiang. And I did that on Broadway. And I did it on national tour. And then from there, I did Juan Darian, the Carnival Mass. I did that with Julie Tamar. I went on to do that. And then from there, I started to do a lot more um, commercial work. Like I had done the Mazzola Corn Oil Girl. That, that really made me a ton of money. It made me so much money. That Emma, commercial. That why was, don't you ooh. why don't you sing? Why don't you ah, there she goes. sing from, <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you sing um the 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 best song from The King and I? Something. I don't think the mic is equipped for me to sing that. And I haven't sung in years, Yvonne. You always put me in the spot. Let me see. Maybe if, if you don't mind, because I haven't sung in like years. Because I, I left musical theater to do, you know, straight television and stuff. But um, let me see. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> don't blow your, your mic out in your I always do this to her. <laughs> as best okay, as you um, is, Okay. Me, me. <laughs> I, I, I can't even remember the song. All right. Okay, here's a little excerpt. Okay. It's wonderful. That's just a little phrase. Oh, you, could do, you could do that my operating room song. Um, uh, Yvonne, she always wants me to sing. Yvonne's always wants me to sing. 
Well, if you have a beautiful voice, I would probably be bugging you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the time, everywhere I go. Same. So, the, the, um, from A Stranger in Paradise. Take my hand, I'm a stranger in paradise. I love this. I'm lost in a wonderland, a stranger in paradise. If I stand story eyed, there's a danger in paradise. Anyway, like that. <laughs> That's just a little yeah. something. That's just a little something. I haven't bravo, sung in years. Bravo, I stopped bravo. doing that. Oh, yeah. And, and, I, and what's funny song. is I saw her, I saw her in that, in the role of uh, Lady Ting. What's that? Lady Chiang. Chiang, Lady Chiang. But we didn't even know each other. I yeah, was I did it. yeah, I did it with you, Brenna, and I also did it with Rudolf Nureyev, you know? And we went to, because I, I remember he's, did a lot of dancing in Canada, especially in Ottawa and stuff. So he um he was a became a great friend, which was interesting because Yul Brenna did not become a great friend. Yul Brenna was a bit, which I was shocked, but he was a bit of a racist. Um, and he displayed that to me, and I had to complain to the production company, to the producer, who had to come into the town to talk to you, Brenna, because he was saying things that were not nice to me. So, and they took care of that, but I did that. And then I, I did this, uh, this, um, I'll never forget this show that I did, uh, a walk on the wild side. I did a walk on the wild side and I'll never forget this because I played a Mexican woman, a Mexican Indian. And I was, um, who owned a gas station in the desert. And I meet this, this white boy, shoeless, shirtless, you know, white boy who comes in showing flexing the muscles and being all that. And I'm a little older Mexican Indian woman and I take him in and, and we kind of like start having a relationship. And there's a scene where, where we're up on the bed because they did the scaffolding thing and they put me in the bed and I wear this tiny little negligee and on and he starts taking my negligee off and and my breast about to expose as it's being exposed that he's about you know kissing me and all over a man fell off the balcony trying to get a look closer <laughs> And all you hear was thup. And I'm going to tell you the director, the laughter, the people were hysterical. They had to stop everything, you know, and dim the lights. And I was cracking. I couldn't believe it. It was so hysterical. He, he literally fell off the balcony. So Irma good, was... Thank in, goodness it wasn't uh, that high. <laughs> Irma was in a show when um, I guess my son was five and he used to have... Oh crush on Irma. Now she's like his second mother, but she used, he used to have such a crush on her. And so I took him, to see, we took him to see the play. He was horrified because every time she twirled around, you could see her panties and he was going, mom, mom, make her stop. Everybody's seeing her panties, everybody. But he didn't make, we were like trying, it's okay, just calm down. I thought he was going to run up there and hand her his coat. But it was so funny. Yeah. Yes, he would always, uh, and when he would see me in the street, he would hide behind Yvonne because he was, you know, he had a little crush on me. Oh, that was so cute. And then he was starstruck <laughs> probably too. Um, yeah, yeah. So I did a lot of those. I did so much theater and then I switched over to, you know, I switched over yeah. to film and then I switched over to just straight, straight acting on just went to television. I would love to hear about your transition to uh, film and TV and what how that what that's been like for you and I know that um I would love to hear what it's like for you being an indigenous actor an actor just who happens to be indigenous and what what kind of roles you're um going out for and and being booked for and well one thing like I mentioned that I did one Darian I had spoken to the director Julie Tamor um we were talking about the, the lead. The lead is a South American Indian woman because it's based on, on the mythical 
things that people think that we're all so mythical and we have all these spirit guys and we see them all the time and they're always with us. Anyway, there's all this stuff. So she once told me uh, they were they had already cast the, the lead, which was the mother, and they gave me the understudy to the mother in one Darian. So one day we were rehearsing at the uh, theater right here, 96 and Broadway, that, and she came to me, she said, I have a question. And I said, okay, you go ahead. And she says, casting, how do you feel about, I know that the role is for a South American Indian woman, the lead. How do you feel about me? How do I feel about the casting? Should it be cast like uh, an Indian or should it, can, you know, can anybody else do it? So I told her this, I said, Julie, if it calls for a South American Indian woman, then audition South American Indians and see what you find. Because lo and behold, you might just find a South American Indian woman who can sing, who can act, and who can move well. But why don't you try them first before you go to someone else? Because I understand that you gave the lead to an African woman. And I know that, you know, she's tribal and the whole tribal thing, but she's not uh, South American Indian. And you're asking me, so I said, why don't you audition us first and see? Because frankly, I can do the part. You know, and I, and I know you cast me as the, as the understudy, but I can do the part like, like that. And it, it's, it was like it was made for me, that part. And she looked at me and she goes, well, I'm not. I can cast it as I feel what I feel like. If I don't want to give it to an Indian, I don't have to give it to her. I'm going to cast any way that I want. If I don't want to give it to this African girl, and if I want to give it to a white woman, I give it to them because it's my show. I went, you ask, okay. I pulled away from that, you know, but she did give me the, the lead when I, we did an international tour. So when we did the Jerusalem Festival in Israel, I did play the mother and um, I did get none of, none of the people who were, um, who did, who did the, I got a theater critic circle award um, nomination in San Francisco with Juan Darian and no one in that company ever did with any of the characters, the way she had casted it. So she was very upset that I was, I was given that honor. She was not happy about that, but that's how she approached me. So yes, there is that mentality. I've come across that many, many times. There was a time that I did that everybody can see it is on the internet is uh, we are in New York and I did the uh, Rose's New Life Cafe where they cast me, the director cast me as the, this Dominican woman and she's the lead, Rosa, I play Rosa. Um, and, uh, I'll, I won't forget this because the producer had never seen me and the, the backers and I had already been cast, contract is signed, I'm doing, they're shooting at up in the heights, they're shooting, I'm doing this. The, uh, the client and the producer comes over to me and the director and said, why does she look so indigenous on film? This is for a Dominican, she doesn't look Dominican. Why, she looks like an Indian. This is who you cast? And he said, uh, she's Dominican, she could be Taino, that's Indian, you know? And they got in his case. And he says, I'm not recasting this. She's doing it, she's, she's, he saw this. See how you have this indentation here? He kept telling the makeup people to fix that black spot. And the makeup person kept saying, but that's her face, is can't fix the cheekbones. You know, but I still did it. So yes, it's been very hard being. Um... And not only, uh, I used to tell them, it's not only the dominant culture, you also face a lot of, well, you did talk about the one thing, but a lot of bias from the Latino industry. Oh yeah, I hardly ever work in the Latino industry, hardly ever. If I'm, I, it's, I can count in, in, in one hand the roles I've done as a, a Latina actress because they say I don't look Latina. 
I look indigenous. I, I, my face looks indigenous on camera so that I can't look uh, Latina. And I said, well, what if you like curl my hair, you know, do, you know, that makeup goes a long way. They said, no, no. So I've never, ever been able to, to get those roles ever. I mean, it happened with, in the Heights. It's happened in um, Gloria Stefan's show. It's happened even now. These, and these are the, the latest shows. I, you know, and I auditioned extensively for those shows. Um, people don't see me as that. They see me as a South American Indian. Yeah, that's such an uh, unfortunate problem in our industry where they're the people who are doing the hiring and, and giving out the yeses and the noes are the ones who are deciding that there is a look to a certain background, ethnicity, heritage, when it's just you are or you aren't. It's not an, it shouldn't be an aesthetic thing. And that's something that I personally try to uh, fight against. Um, and so it's interesting to hear well, I've been fighting that all my life, ever since I was, I started in the business. I've been but, fighting it all my life. I mean, I've, I've come very close. I mean, I've had, um, you can still hear me, right? I've had people would, I mean, I've had producers and directors want to cast me by the couch for like, uh, uh, when I was this, this gorgeous, slender, beautiful little actress, you know, producers will come up to me and, I, and they will say uh, sexual things in my ear. You know, you want the role? This is what you need to do. Oh, I went through all that. I went so, through a lot of that. I was wondering um, what have been some of your favorite roles of late, of recent, in the past year, couple years? Anything that sticks out? Anything that we can go and maybe watch? Um, let me see. I don't know, because I've been doing a lot of character type roles right now on television. Um, yesterday, I, I had my For Life came out, and that was nice to, if you all saw it. The oh. final episode of For Life. And I'm in one of the scenes in the courtroom scene. And it turns out, because I hadn't seen it, um, uh, the the full the full um, series um, the full episode and I saw it for, for yesterday and in the episode they say um, they mention my the character the of the guy that plays my grandson you know they mentioned they said we're gonna look into that case that you did with this boy Jose which makes me think that they're gonna bring those characters back. Which is my, which, and I'm the grandma to Jose. Oh. And they left it saying that. They left it with the district attorney say, we're gonna look into that, that court case that you let go of Jose Gonzalez. So, which means that that might just come back again. And so, and I did two episodes of that. And then I have the one that's coming up, The Undoing, that was supposed to open up in May. Now they're pushing to the fall because they don't have enough new shows. Mm -hmm. So they push that um, HBO to the fall. Yeah. So, but I don't oh, think I've the had life one, the life one for life on ABC for life. You can catch it on Hulu on okay. repeat on Hulu. Or on demand. Or on demand. Yeah. ABC on demand. ABC, yeah. and, but believe it or not, one of my favorites, actually one of my favorite shows was One Darian. Believe it or not, even though um, she said what she said to me and, and she's a wonderful director with puppets and, and I did learn puppetry with her. So that was a great thing uh, because she's known for her, her puppetry. Um, and I did learn that, and I did love doing one Darian because it touched something in me. It made me think about things in my life and my family, and um, with the whole thing, mysticism and spirituality of it. So yeah, I like that. And the great thing about the one Darian was that the finale 
was written for me. The composer Elliot Goldenthal wrote the finale with me in mind because I was doing the understudy on Broadway at Lincoln Center. And he came to me quietly and he says, I'm gonna write you this piece and it's gonna be the final, but don't tell anyone, especially <laughs> the girl who's playing the lead. <laughs> and I said, okay, so I stayed in the hush hush and we would practice and he would figure out. And the way he wrote it, he wrote it almost like, like a chant, like, um, like a wailing song, you know, like, because it was a mountain song and he wrote it with me vocalizing loud and fiercely as, you know, and just wild. They had my hair all wild and I came out almost like a skeleton. And that was the finale. It was dramatic, it was powerful, it was intense. And he wrote that for me and I, and I would always be grateful to him for that. Unfortunately, he wrote it after we did the recording. So it's not in the original recording, but, um, that was problematic because when the girl who played the lead found out, she demanded to be in the scene. What network is that on? There's no network. That's Juan Darian. That was on Broadway. Juan, like the Juan name? Darian. It's based on it's based on South American folkloric story about Juan Darian. Yeah, so it's about a little boy I who thought turns you said into Juan. a. I thought you said Juan Darian and I no Juan Juan Juan, Juan. Darian. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a South American folkloric tale, um, and um, she demanded that she be put in the finale as well. So they had her at the end as I'm doing this magnificent chant and I'm coming in down with all the skeletons. All the dancers were dressed as skeletons coming down. They had her coming in through the wings with the little boy who plays the one character and she's soothing him and all that with the puppets and then she leaves because it... so that's what they had to do for her because she she demanded that and you I were in Ray Donovan I was in Ray Donovan yes I play a shaman and that was the one I told it I told Yvonne and I told Tannis about where they had this white woman who they hired to come right. in, yeah, they hired, yeah, to come in to do this. That was, that was to coach me, to coach me, to coach me. They paid her a lot of money to coach me. Yeah, something we run into as actors who are indigenous, that uh, we run into that. And then if, if that doesn't work out, then they come to us for our, our own uh, free consulting, it seems like. Oh, uh, we have a question in the chat box that I'm going to ask because we're, we're getting close to seven, so we're going to start to oh, wrap yeah, up. Yeah. But, um, what is one of the best lessons you learned career-wise and advice you would give to young Indigenous folks today? Well, go out for everything. Even if it says, uh, even if it doesn't say Indigenous, if it fits the description of what you are, your age category, your look, your type, forget about your ethnicity. Just go and audition for it because it, they might change their mind. And that's happened to me a number of times. So don't say no, just go, go and do it. Go to the open calls, you know, cause sometimes when you are committed or signed up with a manager or, or an agent, sometimes they're very narrow minded. They don't think about that. So you sometimes have to go around them and just go and audition. And if you do happen to get the part, then you can tell your manager and your agent, hey, I got it, you negotiate for me. And that'll give them an idea, say, wait a minute, I didn't even think about sending this person for this. And that'll change their mind to send you for other things that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, indigenous, so what? You know, I've, I've, they've told me no a lot of times. I've, and that's all they can say, no. And what was the other part of that question? Um, just best lessons you've learned and advice. Yeah. Well, that was all intertwined in that. That's great. You know, That's just great. go out for whatever you can. Um, stay within your age group because then you don't want to be embarrassed and just go out for whatever you can. No matter if you go to open calls, just do it. That's fantastic advice. 
and train, train. And if you don't know someone, ask. If you don't know about something, ask. If you don't know how to pronounce a word or whatever, I'm sure you have other people, ask mm -hmm. for help, for information. Don't be afraid because all they're all going to say is no, move on. Yeah, I love that. Um, I Someone said to me once um, that you're only one yes away at any given time. Mm -hmm, that's right. <laughs> oh, true. Um, so, oh, another question. We'll take this as the last question. Uh, mm -hmm. what's, what's your most recent work that you've done that what did you, is there something you worked on Lee that isn't out yet that you're waiting to come Yes, out? yes. Something that I'm doing yeah, with Dan Danielle. Um, we're doing this thing called a podcast. It's a, it's a play for the radio. That's not out yet. We're working it. We're working that remotely. That's yeah. something that is something I've never done. I've never done a radio play. This will be a first for me. And this will be a teaching experience, a learning experience for me. I've never done that. I don't know how to work remotely like that, how to record into my iPhone, send it to the engineer so that he can fix it and, and work with people that are in the UK, in the Canadian Alps, in California. That's where everybody's scattered. They're all sending in their parts. The engineers have to figure it out. The, uh, the musician, the, what is it? The composer has to insert the music into whatever. I've never done this. It's all new. This is exciting. <laughs> That's awesome. And what is it called? Bird Woman. Great. Saka Yahweh. Mm -hmm. her, her story. And I play the older version of her, the 80s, the 80s plus year old version of the young Saka Yahweh. Saka, wow. Saka Yahweh. Yeah. Wow. That's what it's about. It's called Bird Woman. I have heard of this. Danielle is doing the, the young version. Fantastic. Are Danielle Jones? Yes. Yay. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Irma and Yvonne. I'm trying to see it. The sun is trying to set in my face here, so I'm going to back up. Um, we so appreciate you joining us today and being our guests of honor, that was fantastic. And I know everyone on Facebook was loving it too. Um, so we will be doing this again next Wednesday. We do this every Wednesday from five to seven with a new guest of honor each week. Um, on behalf of the American Indian Community House, um, once again, my name is Tanis Peranto. I'm the events and media manager. Um, we have more events this week, tomorrow, uh, Thursday at eight o'clock, we have uh, Native Theater Thursdays, which is new. Um, we're reading a full length play called Indian Country tomorrow by Nipmuc playwright Kaylee Turner. And I'm just going to read you the synopsis real quick. Indian Country is a modern day Native American story centered on the Goler family. Makia is a mixed blood Native American teenager who wants nothing more than to compete in the annual princess competition, something she has long dreamed about and is finally of age to participate. Complicating her dream, the tribe is being faced with inner turmoil around land rights and a strict application process of filing for federal recognition and who is deemed to be a real Indian. Wise Owl, patriarch of the Goler family who is now confronted by the issue of what is a real Indian is being forced to balance his loyalties between the tribe's interests and his stepdaughter's happiness which is uh, timely since it's census time right now. And it's very important to fill out the census because we're, um, we all need to be counted. Um, and we are seeing issues um, with federal recognition and land being taken away because of being undercounted. So um, we would also like to thank our funders, one of which is the New York City um, Complete Count Fund and Decolonize Wealth and the Nova Foundation and New York Women's Foundation. And Friday we have Fit Native class at noon with me and Saturday and Sunday we have Sacred Spaces honoring our elders talking circle, which is similar to this, but more of a conversation among everyone and checking in with each other. And then on Sunday at three o'clock, Live on Facebook again, Sheldon Raymore will be giving his update for the community house and all of our events that are happening.
happening. And Tuesday is our social justice series again at six o'clock. So hi, hi for joining us.